Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Yider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Shadow Hunter Blinds, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Indeed, this is the big guy, Mike Avery. Thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to another edition of the Outdoor Magazine show right here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network, some 30 stations across the great state of Michigan, talking about the great outdoors, the history and tradition of the outdoor lifestyle here in the great state of Michigan and occasionally beyond. Uh, And so glad to have you along with us. I hope that by the time you hear this show, it's actually warmed up a little bit. and And the forecast does call for that because it has indeed been chilly, hasn't it? I know sitting out in the turkey blind or on the water walleye fishing, it's been just a little bit chilly. But hey, it's Mother Nature. She does what she wants when she wants. And I always say that's part of the appeal in my mind of this outdoor lifestyle that I love so much. Because in our day-to-day world, most of us, have a certain amount of control over what it is that happens. Now, I don't mean in your interactions with other people or your work schedule or whatever, but when it comes right down to it, you you push a button and something happens, whether it's in a shop or whether it's at a computer. It's, it's more of a, in some cases, a full-blown, flat-out digital world where you do something and there is a reaction as a result of what you do. When we go outside, when we go outdoors, when we deal with Mother Nature, that goes away. We have no control, no input over the weather. We have very little control over how the critters react to us when we're out there, whether we're fishing or hunting. And that's part of what I love. We are in their environment. We are in their world. We're trying to match wits with them. Sometimes we're successful. A lot of times we're not. And isn't that fun? Isn't that a nice break from our day-to-day world where when we do something, there's a direct reaction? Now, you might get a reaction when you're turkey hunting. Say, if you use the wrong call, you'll get a direct reaction, all right. (laughs) But not the reaction you want. And again, I love it. I absolutely love it. That's why, that's why I consider it to be such a blessing to be here at this microphone every week. Because it's something I would be talking about. It's something I do talk about anyway. Whether it's here in the studio, whether it's on the podcast, whether it's online, or whether it's just shooting the breeze you know, over a cup of coffee with my buddies or family or friends, this, this is what I talk about because this is what I relate to. And I know a lot of you listening have the same frame of mind, the frame reference. But I hear constantly from people who say, Avery, I don't hunt or fish, but I listen to the show because I find your topics interesting. And to me, that's the ultimate compliment. If you don't hunt or fish, but you listen to this show, (laughs) what more could I ask for? Since we've last talked, a couple of interesting things have happened to me. I was able to finally get down on the Detroit River, walleye fishing with Lance Valentine. Now, I've got to be careful. I'm I'm used to saying with Lance Valentine of Walleye 101. Well, Lance is easing away from Walleye 101, and he's moving into the teaching fishing because he didn't want to be pigeonholed into the world of walleye, and I get that. So this is a trip that we had planned for a couple of weeks ago, and Lance said, listen, you can come down if you want, but you're going to catch two or three fish, which is fine with me, but the weather was so rotten that day. It's like, well, why go out there in terrible weather conditions not to catch any fish? He said, I've got an opening in a couple of weeks. Do you want to take it? I said, absolutely. And the good thing about this time is uh, my son James was able to join us. Now, Nick Grillo of Michigan Brand Meats and I had been planning this trip Uh, I asked James the first time around. He had to work this time. He had the day off, so that made it even better. So we get down to the river. 
Uh, Lance had said, look, it, it's still been pretty tough, but it's getting better. And I will, t- uh, it's, it's an interesting discussion, and it's a bigger discussion than I want to get into right now as far as how that fishery on the river may be changing. It certainly isn't the same fishery this spring that they've seen down there in the past, and there are some thoughts and concerns about, okay, is this a... Is this an anomaly, or is this the beginning of a trend? Too early to say, of course, on that. But it was um, like in the 50s or so. It was overcast when we got there, but the forecast said it was going to start to rain. And it did. And it rained the entire time we were on the water. And it was just cold enough where it was one of those days where if you didn't have gloves on, if you left your hands out, uh, they did start to ache, started to hurt. So it was... It was, the weather was iffy, but the fishing was actually pretty good. I think we ended up with 15 fish over the course of three hours, uh, lost a lot of fish. I think I had probably three or four bites that, that wanted to get caught, but I just didn't hook up with them. But it sure was fun to get back into a jigging situation. As much as I love to troll, troll specifically for walleye most of the time, there's nothing like having that rod in your hand when a fish hits. Now, if you've, if you've never jigged before, it's about the most simple way to fish, the basics of it at least, that there is. You've got a weight on the end of your line with a hook attached to that weight. It's called a jig. It sinks to the bottom. You either put live bait on it or, in this case, plastic bait, rubber bait, and you bounce it up and down on the bottom as you drift along with the current. And so the fish usually hit, sometimes they'll hit on the drop, but, you know, it's up and down and up and down and up and down. And it kind of lulls you into this sense of, well, my mind starts to wander. It's like, this is fun, but my mind is wandering somewhere else. And then, boom, you go to raise the rod and the fish is there. And it's, <laughs> it's wonderful. I love it. So we had a wonderful day on the river with Lance. And Lance, I thank you for that uh, very much. And again, a reminder, it's not Walleye 101 anymore. Because I did a live uh, a thing on Facebook there, and I kept saying, Walleye 101. And when we were done, Lance said, would you quit saying Walleye 101? Will you say teach and fishing? I said, Lance, why didn't you correct me while we were live? Well, I didn't want to be rude. Well, go ahead and be rude. Let's, let's get it accurate. Let's get this, this report accurately. Okay, so that was a lot of fun. I uh, also had an interesting morning in the turkey woods. Um, and I have not, my, my season goes, by the way, through the end of May. People are saying, listen, you've been hunting since April 17th. How are you still hunting? I have ZZ, Southern Michigan, private land hunt that goes from April 17th through the end of May. That's how I'm still legally out there. But I haven't been out much lately because of weather, work schedules, uh, some other uh, church activities and stuff that had me tied up. Um, but I was able a couple of days ago to get out. And uh, this is a property very close to my house. And I checked with my buddy Doug, the landowner, the night before. I said, hey, I want to hunt tomorrow morning. Any problem with that? He says, nope, go right ahead. Love to have you over there. So, uh, and this is the property that was my number one early in the season. But I, there were no birds. They disappeared. Well, guess what? The birds are back. I don't know where they went, but they're back. So I'm, as, as I pull up there that morning, there was a different truck at the farm, which I didn't think anything of it, because a lot of times there's different vehicles and boats on trailers and campers and such there. I didn't, didn't think a thing of it, and I'm still half awake, to be honest with you. So I'm walking out there in the dark. It's just maybe starting to get light a little bit. The, the, the robins are chirping, but the turkeys haven't started to gobble. So there's your time reference. As I'm walking out there... I look up, and this is, a, this is a tree farm, and I'm walking along, and I look up, and I, and I see something, and I'm thinking, is there a tree there, a small tree there? I don't remember that small tree being there, but it's dark, and I see a silhouette. So I keep walking toward it, and finally, it's starting to freak me out a little bit, and I said something like, hey, or what? And there's no response. I thought, oh, okay, well, it's a tree, Avery. <laughs> you snap out of it. So I get a few steps further, and, and this tree goes, hey, Mike, whoa, this is somebody else. Now, now my mind is like, what's going on here? I talked to Doug. I got permission to be here in the morning, and, 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 and I was rattled, and he was rattled. And I said, hey, I, I talked to Doug, the property owner, last night. He says, well, I've been trying to get a hold of him, but I couldn't, so we just came out. He said, so I just came out. I thought, well, uh, you know, I, I got permission to be here. You don't. So we, 
we kind of awkwardly, you know, he started to pack up his stuff and leave. And it was, it, was, it was really uncomfortable and awkward for both of us. I know it was. And then as he's leaving, and I got my stuff in the blind, I realize he's got somebody else with him. He's got a kid with him. Oh, my gosh. So, but by now, they're, they're packed up and they're walking away. And I thought, oh, well, I got permission to be here. He doesn't. And I was feeling really bad about this. Long story short, uh, there were three birds gobbling that morning. I was not able to call one of them in, but the entire time that I'm sitting there, I'm not, I'm not feeling right about this. This isn't right. So what I decided to do was, I, I've got other properties to hunt. I left my blind there. I took my decoys and my uh, tripod and stuff out of there. But I told Doug, I said, tell this guy that he, as far as I'm concerned, he's got this property till the end of the season. I will not go back in there. I will not bother those guys. I'll leave the blind, that Wraith 270. I will leave that blind there for you guys and wish them nothing but luck. And then I felt, okay. Then I felt a little bit better. Do not have my bird yet as of the time that we have recorded this. I will be back out there again a few more days. But I've heard that my boat, the Angler Quest, is going to be done this week. So that might just put the end to my turkey season right there. We'll find out. Coming up, uh, coming up on this week's show, after the break, the Sturgeon General, Brenda Archambo, talking about the Sturgeon spawning run. Mark Torregrosa from M Live and Farmer Weather. Well, I can't gripe about the weather conditions, the temperatures by the time you hear this show, so we'll talk about Great Lakes water levels, Nick Grillo of Michigan Brand Meats, and hour number two, Chad Stewart from the DNR talking about fawns, Cody Norton talking about time to apply for your bear tag, and in hour number three, Mark Martin talking fishing here in the great state of Michigan right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Traverse City on WTCM. That's 580 AM. You can hear us in Port Huron on WPHM 1380 AM. And north of the bridge in Newberry, WNBY 1450 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Speedy Blaze. Speedy Blaze is a safe, uh, clean, water-resistant, insect-resistant, alternative to natural firewood. It's safe to cook over because it's made from recycled hardwood. Uh, you can use it in your grill, uh, your campfire, your fireplace, the backyard patio. I mean, any place you can use uh, wood, burn wood, you can use Speedy Blaze. And Sherm Hubbard of Speedy Blaze is uh, coming out with a new uh, Speedy Blaze grilling pellet to use in those pellet grills. Very excited about that. Check them out online at speedyblaze.com. That's speedyblaze.com. While you are online, of course, I'd encourage you to check out my website, mikeyreoutdoors.com. Then head on over to sturgeonfortomorrow.org. Sturgeon for Tomorrow, of course, the uh, group that's been spearheading and raising awareness about these giant prehistoric fish in Michigan for for quite a while now, and Brenda Archambo has been leading that charge. In fact, they call her the Sturgeon General, and she's with us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Madam Sturgeon General, welcome back. How are you? Well, good morning, Mark. How are you doing this morning? I am doing uh, just great, but I understand it's kind of an exciting uh, time in the Sturgeon world right now. Well, it is. If it would finally warm up, uh, you know, it's been cool. It's been an odd spring, as we all know, but... Uh, We've been on Sturgeon Guard for just over a month, and we've probably got another month to go. So, um, you know, the cold weather is not in our favor usually because the water temps are cold and about 45 or 50. We like to see 55 or 60. But there's been some action in the river, which is exciting. When you say, uh, say uh, Sturgeon Guard, what is that? Sturgeon Guard is a program that we coordinate. This is our 22nd year. And our role is just to be on the river, visible, low-key, to deter any type of illegal activity. Because we've known that uh, for many decades, people would come and poach the sturgeon when they're in the river. So we coordinate, uh, coordinate volunteers around the clock to uh, stand vigil over the sturgeon while they're in the river spawning so they can naturally reproduce. Um, so that the population can grow, uh, which it has been uh, because we've been at it for a long time. But at the same time, 
uh, MSU DNR research team is in the river collecting biological data on the spawners. What river is this, Brenda? It's on the Upper Black River in Sheboygan County, although we do uh, actually patrol other rivers along with uh, law enforcement from the DNR as well as the tribes and and other uh, operators. But um, primarily uh, we're focused on the Upper Black River right now. So are there sturgeon spawning or getting set to spawn in rivers across the state right now? Is the population uh, to that extent? Um, yes, I think, you know, over the course of the last 20, 25 years, there's been a lot of research on sturgeon and recovery efforts and, you know, streamside rearing facilities across the basin. And so, you know, as we go forward, we're going to be coming in contact with more and more sturgeon. And that's a good thing um, because we're beginning to see a slow rebound. Of course, it takes 20 years for a sturgeon to mature to reproduce. And that's one of the variables, but um, they're vulnerable when they're in these systems and we need to keep an eye on them. Um, One uh, important thing to note is that we have worked with the legislature to um, pass a bill to increase poaching for sturgeon. It's House Bill 4470. And so we call that the sturgeon bill. So we hope that... um, you know, this session, we'll be able to get that. It's in the House now, get it to the Senate and have a conference to make it become law. What What is the fine on a sturgeon? Uh, if you look back in history, uh, you know, it's, I guess it's when it goes to the justice system, um, you know, it should be around $1,500. And when you look at a moose or an elk or a bear, um, those are 3500 to 10000 And so we wanted to elevate that um, because, you know, part of it is the public persona. Obviously, we need to have a deterrent for people who would be doing these things. So we're starting out thinking uh, maybe 5000 However, um, in, in some cases, that might not be enough. So uh, the discussion has started in the House uh, right now to, to, to pass the Sturgeon Bill. Well, that, that is exciting. I mean, when you look at these fish, and, and, and by the way, we all saw the picture of that one that was uh, netted or caught down in the Detroit River by researchers that was wow, just absolutely huge. Um, these fish are valuable, and they're prehistoric, and they've been around longer than we have as individuals. Uh, that's right. And so, I mean, and they're native, um, and they need our protection. And I, as I mentioned, you know, as as time goes on and you know there's been a lot of research and management uh, activities we're going to be coming in more and more contact with the sturgeon you know you should catch and release it Um, don't put your hands in their gills if you decide you're going to snap a picture that's a no-no and we just need to know uh, and educate the public on the importance of them having them here that they are on the rebound and um, you know they're they're worth saving well, you guys are so patient, Brenda, because when you talk about a resource that you can't see the impact of your work for maybe 20 years, a, a, you know, a walleye, you can see it in a couple of years. You can get them to spawn in two or three years. You're talking fish that don't spawn for 20 years. What caused you years ago to embark on this venture that you knew you weren't going to see the results of right away? I think a lot of it is part of our local culture um, and our winter outdoor heritage. Um, we learned that the state was developing a, a lake sturgeon management plan. We wanted to be a part of that. And in our local area, we learned that there was an inordinate amount of poaching occurring. And when that happens, your populations are in decline. And data led to that conclusion. That's why we said, okay, then what do we, what can we do? Um, and a lot of the, uh, anglers, um, stood up and said, you know, this is not right. We will be a part of this guarding program in an effort to protect the sturgeon while they're spawning so that the, you know, the, the fish can begin to reproduce. And so, yes, it's been a long, long journey, but we're beginning to see the fruits of our efforts now. And that's very rewarding. So a lot of the work, in my view, is personally, it's, it's legacy work now. Um, after, you know, over two decades, 
Um, and it's been a lot of educating and engaging and mobilizing diff- diverse constituent groups around Lake Sturgeon recovery. For most of us here in Michigan, we will never, ever see a sturgeon. But if you want to see one, um, this is really a time of year, unless you, you, you're you fishing for them intentionally or you hook one, land one uh, as, a, as a bonus catch. This is really a time of year when you can get to see them in their natural environment, maybe up close and personal. That's right. And, you know, during the sturgeon guard and also the research We also have a sturgeon in the classroom program whereby we deploy a couple dozen sturgeon um, in classrooms throughout the states to educate our next generation of conservation stewards about the importance of sturgeon and what they mean to the ecosystem and the communities, you know, where they are. So um, converging three different programs during the springtime is a juggle but it really gives people an opportunity to get out on on the river, watch spring come to life, see these sturgeon up close, and, you know, be a part of the solution of, of, you know, creating a brighter future for the fish. Well, you had to work on public awareness, and you've been very effective at that. Uh, The rivers, the waters had to clean up. That's a big part of this as well. But what about the natural flow? What about dams and such? What kind of a role does that play? Well, they're definitely an impediment. You know, it's kind of like having clogged arteries, right? If you look at your 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 own health, um, you know, if you have clogged arteries, um, that's a problem. And so that's basically what the dams do is they impede passage uh, to historical spawning ground. And what that does is it reduces the available habitat for the sturgeon spawning. How long now, I I know you say it's been delayed a little bit because of the cooler than normal spring, if there is such a thing as normal anymore. How long would you expect these fish will be in the river? How long will you be out there keeping an eye on them? I'm going to estimate probably to early June is when we uh, plan to to make a a presence. If it's going to be longer, we will definitely extend um, our schedules out to then, but in our particular case, we know there are three and sometimes four distinct spawning groups. So if an adult spawner spawns in the first early run, they spawn in the early run or the mid run or the late, like around Memorial Weekend. So we'll be out for several more weeks. And um, right now our schedules are pretty flushed out and full, which, you know, gratitude for uh, volunteers for stepping up to be a part of, of this movement. Um, but it really is a, a great time to get out in the wilderness, get some nature therapy, and, and then to see these wonderful animals uh, in the river because our system is pretty narrow, uh, pretty shallow, and you can see them, especially, you know, polarized sunglasses are a must when you're out there on the river. So um, it, it's pretty magnificent to just see people from all walks of life galvanizing around our movement. Well, I, I think it's wonderful uh, what you've done, and I can't imagine, I mean, why somebody would want to poach a sturgeon these days with, with what we know about them. The, uh, the, you know, it's just, you, you've done a good job, and I, and I appreciate it, Brenda. Well, Keep up the good you. work. It's really about the people at the end of the day, the people who have rose up and, and care about the resource and can carry this legacy on to future generations. Well, and you're one of those people, and nobody else is called the Sturgeon General. Keep that in mind. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Brenda, always a pleasure. Good luck, and uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, Mike. Take care. Uh, you as well. Brenda Archambo, the Sturgeon General. I remember, and it has been 20 years plus, the first time Brenda reached out to me and said, hey, we've got this idea, and, and, and you know, I'd see her at these little sports shows uh, talking about the sturgeon and, and, and with the displays and such, and, and she hasn't done this by herself. I know this. She knows this. She's had an awful lot of help, but it's been her, her drive, her guidance, uh, her impetus that, is, that has put, uh, uh, I think there's a sturgeon group down in uh, Kalamazoo County on the Kalamazoo River now, St. Clair River. Jim Felgenauer has been very active down there. Um, it, it's a really, it's a great conservation success story. So congrats to everybody involved in the Sturgeon for Tomorrow program. We'll take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. When we come back, let's talk about the the Great Lakes water levels and how much they've dropped and how and why with Mark Torregrossa right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear 
here, the Outdoor Magazine show in Alpena on WZTK. That's one uh, 105.7 FM. You can hear us in Battle Creek on WBCK 95.3 FM. And in Manistee on WMLQ 97.7 FM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by MUCC's On the Ground program. OTG is a program to improve habitat for fish and wildlife across the state. For details, check out the Michigan United Conservation Club's website. That's MUCC.org. MUCC.org. And a reminder, use the promo code MIKE, all caps, M-I-K-E, to uh, save 25% on your MUCC membership. Uh, as Brenda Arshamba was talking in the earlier segment, it has been, uh, it, at least it feels like, uh, a little cooler spring than normal. Now the forecast uh, looks like by the time you hear this show, it's going to be warming up, and won't that be nice? Uh, when I start thinking about uh, weather, weather patterns, and, and water levels and such, my go-to guy is Michigan's meteorologist, Mark Tora Gross. So you can find him at MLive.com and FarmerWeather.com as well, and he's with us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Mark, welcome back. How are you? I am doing great. I'm looking forward to... What looks like a fantastic stretch of late spring weather. (laughs) And it's about time, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it is. You know, I guess I I always feel like everybody rushes it, but once you get to mid-May, you want it to stick. You know, one of the complaints I hear most about Michigan weather is we go straight from winter to summer, (laughs) is what a lot of people say. And I think this weather pattern is going to avoid that. I think we're going to have... A lot of uh, upper 60s to mid 70s for highs in the next couple of weeks, and truly a, a great spring, late spring type uh, pattern to enjoy. Wonderful. Well, I'll be looking forward to that. Also, uh, a topic of discussion these days is uh, Great Lakes water levels coming down and actually coming down pretty, pretty dramatically. Yes, um, we will not have to worry about record high levels again um, this year. Uh, the Like, for example, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, they're about 17 inches lower than this time last year. Wow. And I got out the calculator and did some math. <laughs> One inch of water on Lake Michigan and Lake Huron is 800 billion gallons of water. 17 inches was something like 14 trillion gallons of water less water now in the lakes than this time last year that is absolutely amazing yes you know and i'd like to figure it out someday but i did some simple math one day and not saying there might been a a couple of beers involved with this (laughs) but it's almost enough fresh water to uh have the world drink for years world so the questions are how does it come down so fast where did that water go and is this a trend that's going to continue you think right um so the the water went away because of lack of precipitation over the whole drainage basin and there's several factors in that winter we didn't have much ice remember you were calling me saying hey when's the ice going to be uh coming on no ice that increases the evaporation that we would have in the winter by a couple of inches. Evaporation isn't a huge factor, but it could be three or four inches in that 17 inch difference. Um, We had a very dry winter, one of the driest, you know, so that can be another four or five inches and we're going into spring very dry also. So uh, it generally can be uh, mathematically accounted for by lack of precipitation over a drainage basin. Now, for example, um, in in April, Lake Superior's drainage basin, you know, there's an area that drains into Lake Superior and there's an area that drains into Michigan, Huron, and area in the area in Ontario. Um, Lake Superior's drainage basin had 125% of its precipitation, of its normal precipitation in April, and Lake Superior went up some went up about four inches. Lake Michigan went up one inch in a, you know, from April to May to now, and that's about uh, two to three inches less than what would nor- what it would normally go up. So even though the lakes are inching up now in their seasonal 
incline, in seasonal increase, they're not inching up as much as they normally would be because we're dry. We're moderate drought. I've had farmers talk to me. You know, they dig they dig trenches and put tile in their ground to drain water off, and they're saying uh, some farmers that have been farming for 30, 40 years, they're digging down three feet, and it's just powder hmm. down there, driest they've seen it ever. Um, the trend in these uh, Great Lakes uh, water levels, uh, can, can you give us a feel for that? Well, I mean, I think it goes with what we get for summer weather, and, uh, you know, if, if it stays dry, they will uh, trend downward. Um, it's it's a hard question to answer, and it goes back to climate change, warmer than normal atmosphere now. And remember when the when, remember in about 2013 when the lakes plunged about four feet, and we said, "Wow, this dry, warmer, drier atmosphere is going to you know really affect the lakes going down." And then all of a sudden, Mother Nature turned on the water faucet in warm atmosphere, and now it's now it's going down again. So I think what it leads to is volatility. Over the course of, you know, three to five years, you're going to see you're going to see the cycles go up and down quicker. Enjoy the sweet spot right now. I know <laughs> Mark, a boater. Always a pleasure. Listen, I got to let you go. Always a pleasure. A very interesting guy to talk to with a lot of insight. Uh, check him out at MLive.com and check out his uh, website, FarmerWeather.com, if you're looking for some great uh, weather reports, wind directions and such, FarmerWeather.com. We'll take a break. When we come back, wrap up this first hour with Nick Grillo of Michigan Brand Meats right here on Outdoor Magazine. Welcome back to Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the show in Cairo on two stations, WKYO 1360 AM and WIDL 92.1 FM. You can hear us in uh, Flint on Sports Extra 1330 WTRX, our newest affiliate. And you can hear us north of the bridge in Marquette on WDMJ 1320 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by the Linwood Beach Marina and Campground. Linwood Beach can be your year-round Saginaw Bay fishing destination and your mid-Michigan tracker and angler quest headquarters. You know I love that. In fact, I talked to Brad Dupuy at Angler Quest, and uh, my boat uh, should be... Well, by the time you hear this show, I may have the boat, and the first thing I will do is run it over to Linwood Beach Marina to have them check her out and get her ready for the water. Uh, you can check them out online at linwoodbeachmarina.com. That's linwoodbeachmarina.com. Uh, one of the people that I know will be on that angler quest this summer is Nick Grillo of Michigan Brand Meats. Their website, michiganbrand.net, michiganbrand.net. Uh, I was telling you in the, earlier in the show, Nick and I, along with my son James, were fishing the Detroit River with Lance Valentine of Teach and Fishing. Uh, a few days ago, and uh, you know, there's several topics that Nick and I wanted to discuss. And I said, "Why don't you come back on the show?" And he graciously agreed. Nick, welcome back. How are you? Good, Mike. How's it going today? Real good, real good. Listen, that trip on the uh, Detroit River with Lance and James was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, man. Yeah, I mean, that conditions, you know, that was pretty tough with that wet, cold rain. But heck, when you're pulling up walleye. You know, every drift we were pulling two to three walleye, so you can't complain with that at all. Can't complain. I actually got some nice ones, too. I think you caught a big one, if I remember right. Yep. Yeah, I think me and James pretty much tied for the biggest, but <laughs> that one had to be, you know, a solid six to seven pounder somewhere in there. It was a real good fish. Yeah, real nice fish. And it's always good to get together with uh, with people of a like mind who love the outdoors, get out there with a guy like Lance. It's just, uh, it's just a lot of fun, Nick. Yeah, that was my first time ever fishing with Lance, believe it or not, and I'm sure happy I did because, you know, the Detroit River, I've been down there a few times, but this was the first time with him, and man, that was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. Hey, listen, uh, how's your turkey season going? I mean, I, I'm i playing cat and mouse with these birds. I have not connected yet, I, and last I'd heard, you were still out there as well. Yep, I'm kind of having that same season, man. It's just... It's tough. I'm putting in the hours, and I'm hearing the gobbles, and we're having them skirt by. But, gosh, this weekend, actually, um, we did have one come in about 80 yards, yards, and he was with a hen. But a beautiful big time out there strutting, gobbling. But, of course, he followed his lady <laughs> elsewhere. And 
I did see two coyotes run across the field in front of me too, and one came about almost 100 yards away. And at first, I thought she, you know the coyote was going to run right at the decoys. It was England right for me. So, <laughs> but so it's been a beautiful year. But yep, still trying to connect. I want to. Well, know. we've still got time. We've still got time. Hey, uh, when we were on uh, the boat there, we, I of course did a Facebook live, and one of the things we talked about was enjoying the outdoors with Michigan brand meats. Uh, you guys are, uh, man, it seems like you're doing well, Nick. Yep. Yeah, we are. We're very lucky where we're at right now. And we're just getting into the fun part of summer where Memorial Day kind of kicks it off for us where there's no turning back because, as you know, summertime traveling in-state especially, that's everybody's on the road looking for fun stuff to do and everybody's in the outdoors and what, what do you got to do you got to snack while you're on the road so <laughs> everybody's course. grabbing road snacks or boat snacks and luckily one of those things is jerky and these hunter sticks so we're uh we're getting ready for our busy time of year and as soon as summer gets rolling then we go right into hunting season and then we go right to into ham season so Memorial Day is kind of our kickoff to where there's no looking back. Well, and you've been working real hard to expand the uh, reach. I mean, you, you, well, you heard a commercial there. You can buy anything at michiganbrand.net and use a promo code and get a big discount, but you want to you want to increase the retail outlets as well. And you got some really good news this past week. Yep, yeah, exactly. So as you've mentioned, you know, you teamed up with a new guy that's um, obviously going to be great Michigan company like you talked about. It's He's Chris up there at Rapid City Knifeworks, and, you know, he gave us a call, and he said, heck, I got a big studio. People are in here buying the knives and the guns and checking out the mounts. Let's put some jerky in here, and we said, that's a great idea. So we actually got another great account up in the Upper Peninsula. Yeah, it's Chris Durson at Rapid River Knifeworks, rapidriverknifeworks dot, uh, US, and they're going to carry all your products now, right? Yep. Actually, just the shelf stable, not shelf taking stable. any oh, okay. refrigerated. Yep. yep, that makes sense, but sure. they're taking everything from our jerky line with our beef and turkeys, all our hunters. They're even taking some wild game. So as you, you know, obviously I've mentioned, you have your Mike Avery peppered elk stick. And we also do have our a kangaroo flavor, and we have even wild boar jerky. We have the venison. We have cherry elk. We have buffalo jerky. He's taking the whole, I mean, everything. So Excellent. we're going to have four different racks in a store that's going to have everything you can look for. <laughs> Excellent. That's so you can stop awesome. by uh, Rapid River Knife Works, uh, check out the, buy a knife, check out the uh, showroom and all the Michigan brand products as well. And again, Nick, michiganbrand.net, michiganbrand.net. Use the promo code. What's the, what's my promo code? It is Mike21. Mike21 to save 20% on anything, and you guys will ship it right to their door. Yep, exactly. Yeah, we've done a lot of that the last month, and it's only picking up, and, yep, we've shipped to Florida. we shipped to Texas, a few people down there, Oklahoma. I mean, we've shipped quite a few out of state, but obviously in, in state's doing real good, too. Excellent. Michiganbrand.net is the website, michiganbrand.net. Uh, always a pleasure to, uh, to get together with Nick Grillo and the uh, Grillo family, uh, great uh, business partners and great friends as well. We'll take a break here for the top of the hour. When we come back, we're going to talk about the whitetail fawning season. I'm seeing some fawn pictures with Chad Stewart. Cody Norton reminds us now is the time to apply for your bear tag. And then this week's Ask Avery segment in Hour 2 of Outdoor Magazine. Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show. Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by J Sporting Goods, the Yider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Shadow Hunter Blinds, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. So thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction. And welcome to our number two of this week's Outdoor Magazine show right here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network. Outdoor Magazine, a three-hour weekly radio show talking about the great outdoors, the history and tradition of hunting and fishing and shooting and trapping and wildlife issues, conservation issues, even some wild game uh, cooking. This is a radio show. 
I feel obligated to say that. You're probably listening on your local AM or FM radio station, and that is, in my opinion, the best way to listen, because there you get your local news, weather, sports, and the uh, broadcast stations get the content. They get the show before I upload the podcast version of the show. But if you can't hear all three hours, if your local affiliate doesn't carry all three hours of the show, or if you live in some small part of our state not covered by the broadcast signal, it's nice to know the podcast is out there. Where do you hear the podcast? Where do you listen to the podcast? Well, that's a really great, uh, great question. Uh, you could go to my website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. The podcast is up there every week. You could go to my Facebook page. Uh, I post it uh, Sunday afternoons at 6 o'clock. We're also on Amazon Music. Now on Audible as well. I love Audible. I listen to all kinds of audio books on Audible, so it's nice to have the podcast version of Outdoor Magazine Radio on Audible as well. It's on my Twitter feed, Avery Outdoors. It's on LinkedIn. It's on LinkedIn. I always say it wrong. It's on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, Player FM, Deezer, Radio.com, and even YouTube. Basically, anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can hear the podcast version of the Outdoor Magazine radio show. Also need to put in a plug for uh, the Outdoor Magazine podcast network. Each month, I uh, record podcasts for Jay's Sporting Goods, Offshore Tackle, Angler Quest Boats, Killer Food Plots, Polar Craft Boats, and Shadowhunter Blinds. Keep in mind... And I'm going to blow my own horn here a little bit. Keep in mind all these people who have all these podcasts out there now, very, very few of them have been doing podcasts longer than the big guy. Just saying. Uh, also just saying that uh, it's the time of year when Mother Nature kind of comes alive in a lot of different ways, Right. And right now I'm thinking about whitetail fawns. Is there anything cuter or more, more cuddly than a whitetail fawn? And it's the one time of year, if you find a newborn fawn, when you could get up close and personal and get a good look at him. Of course, you want to be careful about that, right? We'll talk about that and more now with Chad Stewart, who is the uh, big game specialist for the DNR. I caught him on a busy morning. He's uh, graciously giving us some time. And Chad, I appreciate that. How have you been? I'm doing great, Mike. How about you? Uh, real good, real good. Um, it, it is a, a, a busy time of year in the outdoors, but what about you guys there in the DNR? I mean, are, are you even back in your offices yet? No, we're not in our offices yet. Uh, the state office uh, employer has not opened things up yet, um, but we are able to go out and, and do field work. Um, of course, my job... Uh, is a lot of desk stuff and answering questions and emails and phone calls. So I don't get in the field as much as I'd like to, but uh, uh, we do have staff that are out and moving around. They're just not able to be um, based out of their office just yet. Chad, is that, is that basically the curse of a job like yours? You get into it because you love the outdoors, you love to be out in the field, and you work your way up the food chain to a point where you don't get to do that as much. Yeah, yeah, a, a, a smarter version of me, much younger, um, would would probably second guess some choices that I've made over the course of my career, and I'd get to go out and do a lot more fun stuff. But you know, I still love doing what I'm doing. But you're right, you know, I, I've done, I did a lot of field work um, when I was younger, um, throughout my 20s and even early 30s, and then uh, you know, maybe maybe it's a good thing as I get older and I start to slow down. Maybe it's a good thing that I'm at a desk a little bit more because I probably can't do the things I used to do. That I you know, twenty years ago. Well, and, and the interesting thing is, though, I mean, you and I realize you don't have control to make these decisions unilaterally, and you're not, you know, making things without approval from above and beyond and everything else. But you are in a position where you can have a direct impact on deer hunting and deer regulations in some ways here in Michigan. Yeah, and that's and that's one of the things that I think is really unique and, and quite frankly, kind of cool about my job. And, and you're right, I, I do not have final say over what gets brought forward, and, and sometimes that's frustrating to me, and sometimes uh, it, it might be a good thing that I don't have final say. Um, but, uh, you know, I certainly make the recommendations. I, I try to look into the biology and, and what the perceived impacts would be. 
Um, and I make those recommendations certainly within the department. And if, if the department supports it, then that's what we bring forward to our Natural Resources Commission. And then, and then they get to hear the, the, the defense of what we're trying to do. And then they get to deliberate and they ultimately have the final say on it. And, but they get to hear at that point um, when our, rec- our regulations are recommended to them uh, from a whole bunch of other stakeholders. So, you know, it's a, it's a very open and, and fairly transparent process in terms of how things are going. And what's really nice is everybody has an opportunity to be, to be heard um, because certain things that might be supported from a biological standpoint might, might impact someone economically, and, and they can certainly voice those concerns. And that's, that's ultimately up for the commissioners and the Natural Resources Commission to, to make the final say and determination on what moves forward and what doesn't. You know, we'll get to fawns here in a minute, but this, I, I find this topic interesting here. Here in Michigan, we passed Proposal G if, if several years ago that all, all decisions would be made on sound scientific all wildlife management issues would be determined on sound scientific information. Is, is social science, is that a science that is taken into account on these decisions? It, it is. There, and there's a lot of things that go into account. So, you know, there's, there's certain things that certainly you can argue one way or another, you know, has a biological impact. But there are also a lot of regulations that we bring forward that, you know, it, it just simply might increase the convenience. Um, you know, it might make things easier. It might might provide more opportunity, um, and it might not necessarily impact the herd biologically. It doesn't mean it's going to hurt the herd biologically. It's just it makes it might make it easier for hunters. And, and certainly, as our hunter numbers continue to decline, we know our deer population is is going to continue in, in most of the state to to grow based on the reproductive potential. You know, we've we've sort of shifted in recent years towards making things a lot easier, um, and we hope that that has a biological impact long term for the for the better. But even if it doesn't, it's not going to hurt the herd. But there's still a lot of things out there that people like or don't like, and and they have a lot of preferences and they have a lot of say. And some of those choices might actually impact uh, whether it's a, an outdoor retailer or, uh, or or the way somebody hunts. You know, where where they. You know, we, we've tried not to be more restrictive. We've tried to be more open with things and, and opening things up. But there are certainly still preferences. And, and I think our commission weighs, weighs a lot of that information uh, as well, especially in some of those biologically neutral um, recommendations that are coming forward. Any significant proposed changes for the fall? Well, we've made quite a few changes already. Um, one of the biggest changes that was made um, earlier in the year was that our, our analyst licenses have been completely restructured. And I don't know how many people know about this yet, um, but, you know, you know, in the past we used to have an analyst license that was good for a specific deer management unit. It was good for public land. It was private land. And, you know, Mike, we had over, I think it was over 100 different analyst license types between the different management units, the public and private. Each one had a very unique quota and what we saw in recent years is that, you know, especially in southern Michigan, we just kept bumping up our quotas to make sure that we were saturating demand because we kept wanting to either stabilize or decrease the deer herd. And, and we just can't we just don't have enough hunters that are willing to take enough antlerless deer to make that happen. So our quotas have become somewhat obsolete, especially in southern Michigan. And we were starting to trend that way in northern lower as well. You know, conversely, in the upper peninsula, we've been extremely restrictive with with our our analyst licenses historically and we'll continue to remain remain really conservative but we did feel that there was an opportunity for some added opportunity um, in some of those locations as well so moving forward our analyst licenses this year you don't you don't really have to go through a lottery system anymore you don't have to go through a drawing you can just buy an analyst license and what we're calling it is a universal analyst license you buy the license and you go out and hunt and it's it's very easy it's very straightforward the only place it comes into effect where it's a little bit more restrictive is what we call our mid snowfall zone in the upper peninsula and there you have uh, a drawing that's associated with participation with with an analyst license you would actually get drawn for an access permit either on the east side or the west side and all of this will be in our hunting and trapping digest um, and if you get drawn for that then you can use it which is a free permit that you would get there's a there's a cost for the drawing 
but if you get drawn for it, you can use your antlerless license in that area, and that's that's still an op- the way that we maintain control um, for for limiting antlerless harvest in those a little bit more sensitive areas. Chad, hang tight. We've got to take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. When we, when we come back, we'll uh, we'll talk a little bit more about any uh, changes coming up, but then I want to get to the topic at hand about white-tailed fawns, and I'm going to throw the question at Chad. <laughs> I'm not a biologist, but I have very, very strong feelings on this, but I'll throw the question at the expert. Is there ever a reason to pick up a white-tailed fawn? Happens all the time, but is there ever a reason to do it? That and more after the break with Chad Stewart from the Michigan DNR right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Sheboygan on Big Country Gold, WCBY, AM and FM, 1240 AM, 100.7 FM. You can hear us in Haute Lake on 98.5 WUPS, a blowtorch station. It puts a signal out all across the northern part of the state. And you can hear us in Lansing on WILS, that's 1320 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Rapid River Knife Works. You need a knife. There's a good chance that you've got a knife in your pocket right now. I do, and I I reach for it several times a day, Uh, even outside of hunting or fishing situations, right? I mean, a knife is just an everyday tool that so many of us use so often. So why not use a Michigan-made knife, a handmade, even custom-made if you want it, a knife from Rapid River Knife Works. Check them out online at rapidriverknifeworks.us at rapidriverknifeworks.us. Um, I, I'm really excited to be working with Chris Durson and really excited to uh, to actually get my hands on one of those Rapid River knives. I, they've got them at Jay's. I've walked by the counter many times and been tempted to buy one. Well, now I am going to get my hands on one. RapidRiverKnifeWorks.us. Uh, we're talking now with uh, DNR wildlife biologist Chad Stewart. <clears throat> Excuse me, Chad Stewart, Michigan.gov slash DNR. Chad, before the break, uh, you mentioned about changes in doe tags. Anything else coming up for the fall season we should be aware of? Yeah, we've got a couple regulations coming up at the uh, proposals uh, at the May commission meeting. Uh, one is just a technical change. Um, we, uh, you know that last year we allowed all legal firearms to be used during the muzzleloader season in Zone 3. Uh, one of the counties that was supposed to be included and was, was omitted from the final order was Muskegon County. So we're going we're gonna to propose adding that one in. We're also going to propose eliminating one of the exceptions that was really confusing to a lot of hunters last year. It was actually brought up as an amendment um, to our regulations last year. It allowed it allowed muzzleloader hunters again in zone three to take any deer which which includes an antler deer on public land during the late antlerless season um, we're going to propose removing that it, we got a lot of negative feedback on on that regulation and then one of the big ones i think that's going to be really i think polarizing for a lot of hunters is we're proposing a complete ban of natural urine and deer deer biofluid products um, either as a cover scent or an attractant in Michigan. Um, so that uh, that one, I'm sure, will gain a lot of interest amongst hunters, and that's a proposal that's coming forward at the at the commission meeting this, this month. Is that a CWD concern? It is, yes. Um, there is concern that those products are not federally regulated. Um, there has been prions detected in, um, in urine, albeit at, at lower concentrations, and that uh, there's there's concern from the department standpoint about introduction of those pathogens into um, the environment where it can be potentially taken up by by white white tailed deer, which would which would establish a, a potential outbreak. So there's there are concerns um, based on CWD for for that reasoning to to prohibit the use of those natural products. Ah, see, I was thinking it was just going back to the. Uh the concern like with baiting, just that it, 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 it might attract animals into a given area, but you're actually concerned about the product itself. The product itself, yeah. I mean, there's obviously the attraction piece to it as well, 
But uh, I think the biggest concern is from a, from an introduction standpoint. You know, you're taking a, a product that is not federally regulated. Um, you're you're putting it out into the environment. Um, you, you, urine itself is very low on the the scale of infectivity in terms of other biofluids. But in a lot of cases, that urine, when it's processed, is mixed with things like saliva and, and even even fecal matter. So some of that goes into the product itself, and and obviously there's that's at a higher concentration than urine. So there there is concern about that. A lot of states have been trending that way. Um, in the past, what we've done is we we defaulted to this Archery and Trade Association's Deer Protection Permit pr- um, program, which basically had a higher um, security level. Basically, it ensured those those facilities that had higher thresholds for. Uh, higher safety measures where, where the products could be used, and, and they are doing away with that that program, um, so we don't have that safety net to fall back on this year. Yeah, the whole ATA thing. Once they basically lost their trade show, I think they've lost their status in the industry. So I don't blame you there. Mm. Hey, listen, uh, you, you said something, and <laughs> I know we haven't even got got the fonts yet, but you said something that got my attention. You said. You know, there was there was uh, I don't remember the wording, but, you know, there was concern or there were complaints or or people were talking about it and you listened. Now, see, a lot of people think the DNR does not listen to what their constituents say. So I find that interesting. Yeah. So so I think uh, you're probably referring to the second topic that we're presenting, which was um, the the allowance to take essentially antler deer on public land yeah, with yeah. muzzleloaders in Zone Three during the late antlerless season, it's it's a it's a lot of it's, it's a long caveat list there. Um, that was an amendment, so that did not actually come from the the department's recommendations last year. Um, it was an amendment that was brought forward because, as you recall, muzzleloader season was shortened in Zone Three last year um, to make way for an increase in the late antlerless season. And there was concern because the late antlerless season is a private only season compared to muzzleloader season, which is a statewide public and private season, that there would be loss of opportunity of about a week for for public land muzzleloader hunters. So the commission passed that exception. Um, We we thought that it might be unpopular and confusing, and the results that we heard, certainly from our conservation officers, um, was that it it was not well received. Um, So we, we, we feel it's important to listen to people, move forward. We, we acknowledge that there's probably not a biological impact associated with that regulation, but um, you know, we, we also want to try as best as we can to be on the hunter side and, and make sure that you know, we're doing things biologically sound for the resource, but also at the same time trying to find that sweet spot where hunters are happy as well. Uh, uh, Chad, I, um, you know, I, I know you got to get into another meeting, so I'm going to let you get out of here before this segment's over, but I, I do uh, one question about fawns, okay? Is there ever a reason to pick one up and take it home? You know, uh, gun to my head, no, there's there's not. Um, you know, from a population standpoint, it's not going to um, make a difference in how the population is managed. Ninety plus percent of the cases that you find and stumble across a fawn, it is completely healthy. The mother is out there and it's it's. That's that's what nature is intending to do. There are circumstances where the mother might be deceased, the fawn is hanging out there, and and the mother's obviously not coming back. And then certainly picking that animal up, taking it to a rehabber because it is illegal to possess a wild animal, including a fawn. Um, you know, unless you have the proper licensing, you know that that is illegal. You could potentially save that individual's life, but again, it's a very small percentage where that's happening. So I, I would default and say no. There is no reason to pick up that animal um, because because chances are the mother has put it there and she is alive, healthy, and she will do a far better job of raising that individual animal than than a human can. Chad, I'm going to let you go, and I'm going to follow up on this uh, topic, but I always appreciate your time. The website, michigan.gov slash DNR, will let you get along with your day. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. All right, always a pleasure. Chad Stewart, uh, big game specialist for the DNR. Whitetails, elk, and moose, if I remember right, are the uh, species that he deals with. Two of those would be a lot of fun, the moose and the elk. Now, they'd be just plain fun. The whitetails would be nothing but a great big headache. I, I would not want Chad's job for any amount of money in the world. I want to go back to this topic of picking up uh, fawns. 
because this is the whitetail fawning period. And, and in fact, I had plans originally to talk with Chad about the impact on the whitetail uh, world during this time. It's second only to the rut as far as the, I don't want to say turmoil, but the way it affects the, the whitetail world. Uh, because you've got the big old matri- uh, matriarchal does that kind of take over this time of year. They determine where they're going to drop those fawns. They pick out their territory, and then it goes down the lines uh, to where you get to these first-year does dropping fawns. They get what's left, and that's why you sometimes see fawns dropped out in the in the outfield of a, uh, of a ball field or in your backyard or next to your patio or whatever. That's how that happens. But going back to picking up a fawn, as Chad said, it is illegal, first and foremost. You cannot possess a wild animal. So you've got that going against you. Um, also, if you find a fawn, I, I say admire it. it they're, they're beautiful. Take some pictures. Shoot some video. But, you know, there's really no sense to get real close to it. Um, the mother, the, you know, they talk about will the mother abandon the fawn if you pick it up. There are thoughts back and forth on that. Or if you touch it, I mean. But there's no reason to pick that fawn up because it's probably not abandoned. And I'll go one step further. If you see a dead doe along the side of the road and her last thing she does is push out that fawn, so you know the mother's dead, in my opinion, as a non-biologist, a non-expert, but a guy with a mouth and a microphone, there's still no reason to pick that fawn up. So what if you do save that fawn's life? How is that animal going to live from then on in the future? If they've been raised by people, they are no longer a wild animal. They're not going to get put back into the wild. If you save one fawn, you're not affecting the population of whitetails in our state significantly or statistically one way or another. But, okay, I, 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 I get why you want to do it. They're cute and cuddly, and you want to save them. But if you save them so they live in a human environment or a captive environment, have you actually done that critter any good? I say no. And to take it even one step further, okay, if the fawn truly is abandoned and you leave it out there and a bear comes along and eats it or an eagle comes along and eats it or a coyote or a wolf come along and eat it, okay, It sounds cold, it sounds cruel, but that is Mother Nature. Mother Nature is cold and cruel. Why would we as people want to interject ourselves in in that equation to somehow think that we know better than Mother Nature? Yeah, so, okay, you could say, well, the doe was hit by a car. That wasn't Mother Nature. <laughs> I, I get that, okay? <laughs> but I guess in today's world, that is part of Mother Nature. My point is, please don't ever pick up a fawn. Please don't ever pick up a fawn. I know you want to. I know you're, they're cute and cuddly. You think you're doing the right thing. Legally, you're not. And I would argue that even morally, you're not doing the right thing. Right, good intentions. God bless you for that. But please don't do it. We'll take a break here on the Outdoor Magazine show. When we come back, uh, we'll continue talking with uh, folks from the DNR. This time it's Cody Norton about the process of applying for a Michigan bear tag. I want him to guarantee me a bear tag this year, but I don't think he's going to do it. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Houghton Lake on the Twister 92.1 WTWS. And you can hear us in Holland on two stations, WHTC 1450 AM and WHTC 99.7 FM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Boning Archery. Michigan-based boning has been a leader in the archery industry since 1946, when Rollin Boning invented feral tight to, go, to uh, glue broadheads to arrow shafts. And at the time, I'll guarantee you, they weren't carbon arrow shafts. Uh, These days, Boning continues to innovate, come up with new products uh, for target archers and bow hunters as well. And the very, very cool thing, this Michigan-based company in 2021 is celebrating their 75th anniversary 
in the archery industry. What a tremendous accomplishment. Congrats to everybody at Boning, uh, current people and folks who have uh, <coughs> worked there in the past and helped to make the company what it is. Congratulations. Check out the website, boning.com. That's B-O-H-N-I-N-G, boning.com. 75 years as a leader and innovator in the archery industry. How cool is that? Okay, so May is a kind of a key month for all those of us here in the outdoors in Michigan. It's the time to apply for a Michigan elk tag and the time to apply for a Michigan bear tag. Now, I know that my odds of getting a Michigan bear tag are far better than a Michigan elk tag. That's for sure. Cody Norton probably knows more about Michigan bears than just about anybody in our state. He's a DNR wildlife biologist, and bears are one of his specialties. Cody, welcome back. How are you? Hey, Mike. I'm doing well. How are you doing? Wonderful, but I'll be better if I get a bear tag again this year. (laughs) I bet. (laughs) What are you planning on uh, applying for? I'm going to apply for the third season for Newberry. Awesome. Now, and, and it, 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 I know that there are a lot of resources online, and I wasn't aware of this until just recently. You can actually uh, get a pretty good uh, feel for what your odds are by checking online, right? Yeah, that's right. We have um, the odds for, you know, whatever the previous year's um, drawing was. Um, you know, obviously that changes a little bit as quotas change or the number of applicants change, but absolutely it gives you a a good a good point to you know try to to <laughs> see if you're going to be yeah. should be successful the next year or not. And now, if I remember right, you have actually knocked down the number of bear tags going out this year, right? So for the Upper Peninsula, um, yeah, overall it is slightly less, um, but actually the Newberry unit is uh, looking at a five percent increase in licenses. Woohoo! <laughs> good for me. Yeah, so it might be a little bit a little bit better odds for you. Uh, will we ever, I hear this all the time, you know, Ontario has a spring bear hunt. Will we ever have a, a spring bear hunt here in Michigan in the foreseeable future? Oh, well, that's a good question, Mike. Um, you know, we just finished up our 2021 and 2022 bear regulation cycle. Um, and that was one of the topics that was brought up by some of our bear forum members and other, other hunters. Um, but we agreed to table that until, the next regulation cycle. So basically over the next couple of years, we're going to be talking about that, trying to flesh out what, what that could look like, what, you know, that proposal might look like and what, what science there is behind it, um, how, how hunters feel in the state and try to make a good recommendation, um, you know, around it. Anecdotally, I feel like the uh, range of the uh, bear population in Michigan, at least in the Lower Peninsula, is expanding further south. We see more and more reports of bears working their way south. But what about the overall bear population? How are our numbers, Cody? Sure. So, yeah, for the northern lower, I mean, the population's been increasing, uh, especially since 2012 when we did have kind of a larger um, you know, harvest and license reduction. Um, but like you said, we've we've got bears showing up farther and farther south, and kind of more consistently. Um, right now, our our latest population estimates from 2019, but there's about 2,400 bears in the northern lower. What about statewide, though? I mean, 2,400 northern lower. What about the UP? Yep. So the UP, you know, we we did similar license and, and harvest reductions back in 2012 in the UP, um, and we've seen that population increasing since then as well. Um, we've our latest estimates about 9,900 bears for the Upper Peninsula right now. Um, so yeah, we've been seeing you know good growth in both populations over the last you know quite a few years. So it's it's been really promising, and the hunting's been getting better and better. So what's the process of getting a Michigan bear tag? Sure. So you need to, like you said, um, you know, right now is the application period, May 1st to June 1st. Um, results will be announced on July 6th. So you'll need to check back in and see if you were successful. Um, But basically, we have a a preference point system. So every year that you apply, you can either choose to to apply for a preference point only, or you can apply um, for a specific hunt period in whatever bear management unit that you would like to hunt in. Um, And like you said, looking online or or in the digest, you can get an idea too for um, how many preference points were required in the past. But Basically, those licenses are, are given out to the applicants with the highest number of preference points 
you know, on down until there aren't any licenses left. And if you look at an area like the far western UP, you might get a tag every year if you go for third season. If you go for Drummond Island or Red Oak or someplace like that, you're going to wait a few years before you get a tag. Absolutely. It's kind of, you know, just depends on where you're looking at. And if you're willing to travel, like you said, you could pretty much have a bear tag every year. Well, Cody, can you promise me I'm going to get a tag for third season for Newberry? <laughs> I'd have to check out your points, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a tag there for last year, so that tells you where I'm at. Sure, sure. That, that might be a little tough for you. but <laughs> I'm going to try. Can, I'm going to try. <laughs> All right, Cody, appreciate your time. Cody Norton from the uh, DNRMichigan.gov slash DNR. Cody's not optimistic. I am cautiously optimistic. I figure my odds are about 50-50, though I have not officially checked online yet. Uh, but don't forget, you know, if you want to apply for a Michigan bear tag, now is the time. We'll take a break. When we come back, this week's Ask Avery segment actually talks about bear hunting. A, a question from Todd Stutz uh, in this week's Ask Avery segment right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Tawas on WIOS, AM and FM, 1480 AM, 106.9 FM. And you can hear us in uh, St. Joe on WSJM, 94.9 FM. The uh, Ask Avery segment is brought to you each week by my friends from Security Credit Union. Security Credit Union loves to work with outdoorsmen and women, and they can help you with your next outdoor adventure. Check them out online at securitycu.org. That's securitycu.org. The way the Ask Avery segment works is uh, this is your chance to uh, be directly involved in the content of the show. You can send me a question, uh, something that you would like me to uh, answer directly or uh, the, pass along to somebody else. For example, if you had a question about uh, uh, getting a bear license, you know, we would, we would direct it to somebody in the DNR, like Cody Norton. Um, this week, and by the way, the, the, probably the best way to get these questions to me is to send me an email, mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com. That's mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com. Um, I do keep an eye on the social media outlets. You can hit me up with a private message there, and I, I often see those. But again, email mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com is the best. And that's what Todd Stutz did. Maybe it's Stutz, but I think it's Todd Stutz. So if it's wrong, Todd, I apologize. But uh, Todd sends me an email to Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. He says, Mike, I'm new to bear hunting, and I hope to get my chance this year with my bow. I'm hoping you can discuss your arrow setup. It is confusing with all the options out there, expandables, fixed blades, two blades, single bevel, weight forward, inserts, etc. What do you feel works the best? I will tell you right now that I do not pretend to be an archery, a bow hunting, or a broadhead or an arrow expert. But I have killed a lot of bears with bows. In fact, I've never taken one with a gun. I've killed them with crossbows. I've killed them with uh, compounds and uh, most recently with a recurve. So I do have some experience in this area. In my opinion... Uh, bears are an interesting critter for a bow hunter. Number one, if you're hunting over bait, which most hunters are for bear, a bow is a perfect tool to use because the animal's coming in at a known distance and you can wait for them to position themselves for the ideal shot. So uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of bow hunting over bait for bears. But the thing about bears is, because of their anatomy, because uh, they might have a lot of fat on them, and especially because of that long, beautiful black fur, you want something that's going to make a pretty good entrance and hopefully a pretty good exit. Because if you use um, a broad head that's maybe non-expandable, a small size, and you don't get an exit... You've got the fat working against you, and you've got that fur that'll soak up a lot of blood, and it'll close up that uh, wound, and you might not get the best blood trail. So I do recommend, this is one of the few cases, if you can, to use an expandable, but one that you trust. 
Now, obviously, if you're a traditional archer, you're not going to use an expandable with a recurve or a longbow. But if you've got enough power there, if you're shooting a compound with enough poundage or certainly a crossbow, I do recommend for bear hunting you use some kind of an expandable to try to get the biggest cut that you can. But again, it's got to be one that you trust. And the only way, unfortunately, to get trust in a broadhead is to shoot it in, in, in a hunting situation. Because they're not all expandables are created equally. Created equal. Some of them are just garbage, i got to be honest with you. Some of them with some pretty big names. So, I do recommend an expandable if your bow setup is capable of it. If you have enough uh, kinetic energy and enough poundage and enough speed. In cases where you don't, like with the, my last bow kill with a recurve, a fixed blade is the only way to go. But again, the biggest biggest blade that you can and for goodness sake you want to cut on contact blade you don't want one in my opinion with a chisel point because you got to push that chisel point through that hide of that animal i like a cut on contact a really good sharp blade i think is the way to go the heaviest setup that you can go as far as uh, the weight of the broadhead and the, and the arrow for the best kinetic energy and and, and it all comes down to shot placement Shot pl- you can take a, a, a marginal broadhead with good shot placement and take an animal down. Where if you have a big, very effective expandable and you hit them in the wrong spot, you might not recover it. So it comes down to shot placement. And finally, even though I've never taken a deer with a gun, or a bear with a gun, I do see this happen a lot. People will come into a, a bear camp and they'll bring a, a, you know, a seven millimeter mag or some big high powered fast shooting rifle. And they're hunting at bait, you know, 30, 40 yards away. I am convinced that the best, the best gun for bears over bait at close range would be a 12-gauge slug. A big, slow-moving projectile that puts a whomp on them. That's what I would recommend for gun hunters, even though, Todd, you didn't ask that question. So, Todd Stutz, I appreciate you bringing that up. That's uh, my take on it for what it's worth. And as always, I appreciate our friends at Security Credit Union for helping to make each week's Ask Avery segment possible. Check them out online at securitycu.org. That's securitycu.org. And if you have a question for me for the Ask Avery segment, again, something you want me to answer directly like Todd did, or something that you would like me to pass along, you know, sometimes I can get access to people that you might not be able to. Uh, let me know. Send me an email, mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com, mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com. And don't forget the website is mikeaveryoutdoors.com. We'll take a break for the top of the, uh, top of the hour. When we come back, we we'll talk some fishing with Freshwater Hall of Fame angler Mark Martin. Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by J Sporting Goods, the Yider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Shadow Hunter Blinds, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Oh, thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to another edition of the Outdoor Magazine Show. Here, Pat, take a look at that. Something we were talking about a minute ago. <laughs> That's a, uh, welcome to hour number three of this week's Outdoor Magazine Show. My name is Mike Avery. Glad to have you along with us. <laughs> Uh, here in the studio with Pat Johnston. Pat, doing a wonderful job as always. I do uh, appreciate it. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it, I've said it before and I'll say it uh, as long as I'm able to talk. It is such a blessing to be here at this microphone every week. Uh, this year is my uh, 40th year in broadcasting. And during that time... You know, I've gone from being a part-time videographer, part-time reporter at a, at a broadcast uh, news station in Flint, Channel 12, WJRT, um, you know, through the different variations and iterations of uh, reporter and videographer and, and, and t- 
television show producer, and now these days, um, strictly radio. Radio and, and podcasting as well, and social media. And it's never been, in, in these 40 years of my career, it's never been a more exciting time to be a content producer. We have the, the technology these days that didn't exist before, um, and it's inexpensive. I mean, it's cheap compared to what we had to spend. I, to go live, I used to have, a, have a, you know, an entire control room and a TV studio and stuff. Nowadays, I can pick up my phone, point it at me, and go live online anytime. So it's very, very exciting, and I'm very excited about it. And I remember the old days. Like there was <laughs> One time, uh, I was fishing. Actually, I was fishing with Mark Martin in the Muskegon Channel, and my dad was with us. And, you know, you got the big old camera, you got the big old recorder, and the batteries for, for, these, uh, for this recorder were, I don't know, as big as, almost as big as my laptop is these days. And I thought I had two fully charged batteries, or maybe it was three or whatever, and I get over there, and it's the middle of the night, and we're fishing along, and my deck started to die. I thought, oh, man. And, and, and that type of thing I just don't have to worry about anymore. And it makes it so much easier to get things done and so much easier to tell a story and so much easier to uh, produce some kind of content. But the thing that hasn't changed over the years is my love for the outdoors, my passion for the outdoors, and the fact that I have been, again, just extraordinarily blessed to work with some very interesting people, the top-tier people, people that I never would have had access to had I not gotten into this field that I have. And talking about, you know, Mark Martin, Mark is a very accessible guy, but because I've, you know, been in TV and radio, I've really had a chance to spend some quality time with him over the years. And I want to talk with him again uh, right now here on the Outdoor Magazine Show. Mark, welcome back. How are you? Hey, great, Mike. Congratulations on 40 years. I uh, I, I just uh, ran into my 41st year of being a professional fisherman, <laughs> making a living at it, so we're we're right there together, aren't we? Yeah, congratulations to you, my friend. But 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 I have never won a professional walleye tournament national championship. I have never been named to the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame. So <laughs> kudos to you. <laughs> well, you're on your way to some Hall of Fame that they have for. Uh, I'm sure you are, and I'll, I'll endorse you when that time comes. <laughs> I, I don't think they got anything like that for for a guy like me. But Mark, listen, you have had a you have had a very, um, and it's not over yet. I mean, you're not ready to hang it up yet, are you? No, no, I I, I want to teach. You know, I I've uh, kind of um, you know just the teaching is going to be the thing that you know keeps me going because I find greater joy in that because I get a lot of return of value. You know, people give me kudos of oh, now I can go out and do it. I feel confident and whether it's ice fishing or open water, or they, they're they on their own boat catching more fish after you teach them how to use their own boat. I mean, that, that's the kind of thing that um, you know, the satisfaction, it feels like you win a tournament every time you get done with one of those schools and you got a whole bunch of people like, you know, wanting to raise you up because they come in with one except, you know, expectation and they leave totally uh, way above that expectation, you know, and that's what I get, you know, so that's what I'm going to keep doing is teaching and, uh, you know, the other stuff in, in writing and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, the rest of it, uh, you know, I, you know, as far as tournaments, I, I might just back off from it a little bit and just kind of, um, you know, concentrate on schools. Yeah, I mean, really, at this point, Mark, you have nothing to prove. I remember back when this whole professional walleye trail started. And there were a handful of guys who were helping to form what this was going to be. And you were one of them. And people would say, yeah, that Mark Martin guy, he's a good stick. But he's a good stick at night trolling for walleye in a specific area. And they discounted your talent and ability. And that same year, you went along, you went on to kick their rear ends and win that, prof that first professional 
Walleye National Championship. And that really kind of set the stage, didn't it? Oh, it did. You know, I mean, it, I mean, I, I can remember that the whole time, every day of practice and every day of the tournament like it was yesterday, you know, and I can remember a lot of them too, you know, it, and uh, it's those things like that that I really got to say that propelled me right there. And just as you uh, said right there, you know, people had their doubts about me if I could catch fish in the daytime. Well, that I think took the, all the doubts right away. And even though I could have been catching fish out on Muskegon Lake and in other places during the day, I knew it was more exceptional to be catching walleyes at night because the size was impressive. So I stuck with the size over just fish. Well, and in those early days, you were fishing at night because you also had a full-time job during the day. Right, right, exactly. So, yeah, I, I for nine years, I would go go to work at, uh, you know, uh, three, be there by 3 and get out at 11, meet my customers across the street, basically, at midnight, and fish till 6, 7 o'clock in the morning, go to bed, do it all over again. I mean, <laughs> just keep, uh, you know, and it's like, I couldn't even imagine doing that now. I mean, I can, but I wouldn't be around for very long. <laughs> and, and I <laughs> remember... Know, just, Oh, well, yeah, and I remember stories you telling me about your granddad when he was exploring Muskegon Lake. He, he would uh, drag a chain over the side to get his depth. Oh, and, yeah. and, and, and and I think you guys were rowing by hand in the early days to get your speed, to get your yep. trolling, weren't you? Right, right. You know, that was the depth finder was that that chain on a, on a, on a rope, too. As, uh, you know, you, you could tell when it was touching bottom and not touching bottom because you're going so slow. And he had a heavy log and chain. And the other thing that he took, you know, great pride in, because there's hardly people fishing back then, you know, tying bleach bottles on 15 foot of cord and put a brick, a rock, a piece of link, a chain, whatever. And we'd, when the wind was blowing into the shoreline, he'd drop them out deeper and let them drift in. To, and when they hung up there, 15 feet, so you knew how much line to let out on these level wind reels that my grandpa had, you know, how many passes back and forth. It didn't have counters. And so you knew if you're on this side of the jug, how much line to let out on this side of the jug. And you constantly had to have, so, you know, I mean, you could see the jugs cause they weren't, they're white for one thing. So you could, you know, see them, they reflect whatever light there was, your eyes adjusted. And if you couldn't, you had a good flashlight, you'd just put up in front. But pretty soon you'd do it night after night. You didn't, almost didn't need to see the jugs. You just kind of, you know, seen where you were on the lake and what you had to do, and you were within reason most of the time. Yeah, I remember counting passes on reels, and the question was, is a pass once from left to right, or is it from left to right and back to left? It was always that question in my mind. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, and if one guy counted it one day, one way, and you were counting the other, you were off quite a bit on your depth. Oh, yeah, if they're counting not a full pass back and forth as one or just one pass across. Yep. Yeah, it, oh, and I've never said this to anybody until right now. You know, I, I mean, a pass is... Because I know my grandpa, he knew that level wind reels, you had to have the same amount of line on each one, even back in them days. And now and that's something we... Yeah, yeah. I never said that before because, you know, it's just something that it blew past my mind all this time. And you just, for some reason, he pulled it out of my mind right now. So he calibrated his reels <laughs> before there was even line counters on them so that... Because he didn't want to lose his lures. See, Mark, that's what I'm here for, to pull this these these bits of wisdom out of your mind. And we'll do that after the break. But first, we've got to take a break here on the Outdoor Magazine Show. We're talking with Mark Martin. You know Mark, Michigan's Mr. Walleye. He's been around the fishing scene here forever. The website, markmartins.net, markmartins.net. Also, uh, Fishing Vacation School, I think, is another one. We'll talk with him about that and more. And, and right now, as we're talking, he's in the Keweenaw. 
He spends a lot of time in the Keweenaw. I want to talk with him about why he loves that part of the state and how the fishing is and how he can help you catch more fish as you head to the water. That's after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Sandusky on WMIC, AM and FM, 660 AM, 95.3 FM. And you can hear us north of the bridge in the Sioux on ESPN 1400 WKNW. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Wilds Plumbing and Heating from plumbing, heating, air conditioning, ductwork cleaning, sump pumps, what else? I mean, anything. To keep the uh, mechanicals, the the uh, the mechanics of your house running smoothly, reliably, efficiently, <laughs> the folks from Wilds can help you out. Check them out online at wildsplumbingandheating.com. That's wildsplumbingandheating.com. dot com. That's dot com. I think we're gonna have the guys from Wilds come back over. Uh, well, for, they're gonna be doing a uh, an air conditioner tune up because it'll be that season before too long. And we have done some work in the house where we've created a lot of uh, drywall dust. And you know that stuff goes everywhere. I think I'll have the guys from Wilds come out and clean out our ductwork again. But not until all the drywall work is done, that's for sure. Again, check them out online at wildsplumbingandheating.com. While you are online, please check out my website, mikeavoryoutdoors.com, and head on over to markmartins.net, markmartins.net, one of the websites of Michigan-based professional angler, uh, fishing educator, uh, winner of the first national uh, professional walleye tournament trail championship, and also a member of the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame, Mark Martin, who is with us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. And Mark, we find you uh, in the Keweenaw this time. You really love that part of the state, don't you? Oh, yeah, I, I do. I came up here. Uh, it's been close to 20 some years ago with Gary Roach, uh, my fishing partner at the time. And we travel around all over the place and take media, outdoor writers, TV, name it, radio. And we come up uh, to different places. And this is one of the places that we bring to the public. We are teaching the public where new places, where to come and go fishing. Well, I never really heard of anybody ever coming here before that much. Even on Michigan Outdoors TV, I never I said, hey, let's bring people up here. I don't know anything about it. You don't know anything about it, but we know about fishing and what to look for. And we know what time of year we're there, and that's kind of how you figure things out. And we come up here. And it was like taking candy from a baby. <laughs> you know, it was like, wow, we look really good. You know, we can go out and catch walleyes. We can go out and catch lake trout. We can go out and catch this, that, pike, bass, you name it. And and we had a different outdoor raider for two weeks every three days. So, we, you know, we would take them out. And I just kind of, like, looked at, at back in those days at the prices on the shore of Lake Michigan, I knew what they were. They were outrageous. And then I picked up a magazine while we were eating at a restaurant, and I went, no, this is like giving it away. It's like buying uh, <laughs> 10 acres in the middle of the woods down in Muskegon. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it, was, it was about that good, you know. It was like, And I went, wow. You know, and I wanted to invest in vacant land, and I just had my buddy – found this place where I'm living now up here and, and he just I, I fell in love with it it was like the guy walked away and disappeared the government couldn't find him for back child support or <laughs> nothing but my lawyer did so <laughs> this is where I'm at right now and 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 I you know I, I just talked to Gary Roach the other day and him and his wife Bev are thinking about coming over here in a few weeks because he wants to revisit some of the places we explored and brought the professional walleye trail up here three different times because that's how good the fishing was. We had two championships here in a regular season event. If that kind of tells everybody, you know, how good it was, it still is, you know. And but it's getting a little more populated, and and 
you know, the splake are biting. You can cast the shoreline right now. The fish are in close. Not only a splake, but you're going to catch cohos doing it. You're going to catch brown trout and steelhead doing that because the steelhead are in spawning right now uh, in front of the little crit mouths and stuff like that. So if you know where to look for these things, you can have a potpourri or go out in 100 and 50 to 200 feet of water and jig with jig and rapalas with fire line and catch lake trout till your arms say that's enough. Mm. <laughs> you know, so, and, and then on this weekend is going to be opening of walleye, and I'm excited about that because everything is just perfect for that. It's like, which lake do I want to go? <laughs> <laughs> That's the hard choice is what do you want to do today and where do you want to go do it? And what do you want to fish for? I like to have them decisions. That's a good decision to have. So it sounds like Gary Roach is still doing well. Yes, he is. You know, he's 84, still got it. He's talking. He's over at his place. He just went out fish for, you know, he's this, um, he just got done fishing um, walleye. I think he, it was an opener last week over there. He was going, his opener opened just before ours opened. And he was all excited about getting out on Mille Lacs and taking somebody out. And I mean, he is going at it. I mean, for 84 years, I hope I have as much ump as he does, you know, to get out there and do it. And he definitely impresses me a heck of a lot. And 84, a lot of people talk about it, don't do it. Yeah, that's good to hear. And, uh, hey, listen, I want to follow up on something, too. I'm, I'm thinking about your granddad trolling around Muskegon Lake, dragging a chain to see what the depth was. And I compare that to the rigs we've got today, the electronics we have today, the tools we have today. Are we better anglers today than our granddads were? Mm. I, I I think it's a different caliber, a different, you know, we're at a different level nowadays than, you know, we didn't have the sophisticated equipment like digital reels or line counters. We didn't really, we had fish finders, but they were only for the people that had money in their pocketbooks. You know, they not everybody had them. In fact, you were a lucky person if you did. Uh, so I think it made you think think a little bit more how to do it the right way back in the day and the same methods I use today are the same just a little bit better equipment we're, we're more prepared to go out and quickly refine how and where the fish are biting compared to the way uh, we fished it you know and now you got side scan you got live target you got you know <laughs> You, you can see fish off in the distance and cast to them and see your lure going down to them. And so there's a lot more uh, that has been opened up in present time. Even, they say, five, six years ago, in the, in the last couple of years, technology has just been racing forward like a rocket compared to what you know, when I started fishing even professionally. So yeah, it, it's it's definitely the the guys that have the knowledge um, that it would be back you know from my time. It's easy you know with a little instruction and a little play around time that they can take these new methods and they've got the ideas in their head how the fish and where the fish should be. So they know where to start looking. Now they just got better tools to look with. What's the key to consistently catching fish day in and day out? What do you go back to? What are the, what's the basic thing that you rely on every time on the water? You know, I, I rely on my, um, my Navionics maps, you know, of the lake, because I know at this time of the year the fish are more likely to be here, here, and here. So... You, that's really, you know, you look at the time of year and you realize what the fish are doing at that time of year. Uh, what species are you going to target and what do they do at this time? And then you look at your Navionics map and you, you pick out, let's say, seven places on a 20-mile lake. 
I mean, because you can. I mean, you can determine there could be more than that, but you are able to quickly see that quickly. And so now you go from, you know, one to the next to the next to the next, and by the time you're done, you've eliminated those many places down to three. And you're catching fish on those three, and you're catching them good. But without the maps, you'd be just looking across the surface, or you're, you would just be using your fish finder and, and going along and looking for structure and everything. So you'd be, waste, you'd be still fishing the right way and looking the right way, but by using the maps, it quickly targets where you better start looking instead of wasting time trying to find it, you know? Yeah, I, I guess I guess maybe the most basic thing about catching fish is you gotta you gotta be where the fish are. Right, right. And you gotta eliminate the dead water. And sometimes if you're out in a big basin like Saginaw Bay where you don't have this, you know, necessary structure type stuff you're looking for, like in a natural lake, <laughs> you're you're gonna be looking for bait fish. So you can go fairly fast, you know, 25, 30 miles an hour or whatever, and you can mark the bait fish, and you can actually mark bigger bigger fish, too. You know, if they're pretty big, you know, 7, 8 pounds, you know, and you go over them at that speed, they're going to be like a little pencil prick. That if you took a sharp pencil and dropped it on a piece of white paper from about 6 inches and it fell, that's as big as a 10-pound fish is going to look as you're going over the top of them. If you slowed down over that little dot and we're going about a mile an hour, it'd be a nice big arc. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on how fast you're going across, what you're looking for, how big that's going to show up on your fish finder. It can be a dot or it can be a long arc all on speed. So you got to learn how to interpret that dot and make it, you know, in your mind, or you kind of understand what a group of a pot of fish look like all stretched out too, and go, oh man, look at that big pot of fish. Maybe I better slow down and start looking around here a little bit. So if you know how to use your electronics um, and and know what you're seeing, and that's the hard part. People are looking for something that jumps out at them. I'm looking for the little minute objects on there that don't stand out to most people and by the time i start to see that and if there's one dot there's a whole lot more around there because it only covers x amount of you know when you're going over well and that's and that's where mark that's where your experience and years on the water pay off mark martin a member of the freshwater fishing hall of fame Michigan's Mr. Walleye, I call him, but he catches far more than just walleye. Mark, we'll let you get back on with your day. Always appreciate your time. Again, the website, markmartins.net, markmartins.net. We'll take a break here on the Outdoor Magazine Show. When we come back, a few more thoughts. And, of course, then we'll all wrap it up. We'll wrap it all up with Wild Game Chef extraordinaire Dave Miner right here on Outdoor Magazine. Welcome back to Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the show. Let me find my list here. On uh, WMIQ and Iron Mountain, 1450 AM. News 97, 98, 98.7 WLDN in Ludington. And in Saginaw, WSGW AM and FM, 790 AM, 100.5 FM. <clears throat> I am actually in the studios of WSGW right now. And for this three hours every week. This one small part of the building is unofficially called the Outdoor Magazine Studio. And I have proof because I have a logo on the wall behind me that makes it so. I'm here with Pat Johnston, who is uh, doing a wonderful job as always. Pat, appreciate that. Thank you very much. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Reader Landscaping. Let's see what the folks from Reader are talking about this week. Fire pits. You know, uh, who doesn't love a fire pit? We had um, family over last weekend celebrating my grandson's uh, college graduation. Talk about making you feel like an old guy. And we had a fire on the patio. In fact, it was a Speedy Blaze fire. 
And the folks at uh, Reader can help you make a beautiful backyard fire pit. Also, uh, it's the last call for a 10% discount on bulk mulch. Nothing makes your your yard look uh, sharper or more finished off than mulch in the beds and around the trees. Uh, that's also for compost and topsoil. And also perimeter uh, pest control. Get in touch with the folks uh, from Reader uh, for that and more. The website, ReaderLandscaping.com. R-E-D-E-R, ReaderLandscaping.com. Always nice to uh, reminisce with uh, Mark Martin. And I was telling Pat, I was telling Pat that I, I had this this train of thought when I was talking to Mark something that I wanted to come back in the studio and talk about. I took a little drink to get a uh, took a little walk to get a drink of water and and, and, I, and I, it left my mind. I said I don't know what I'm going to talk about. And Pat said, Why don't you talk about what we were talking about before the show started? <laughs> and one of those topics was. And I don't remember how we got on the topic, but it was um, old music, rock music, and you know different musicians and, musicians and such. And I was telling Pat that I actually got to spend some time, and this is a long time ago. Uh, remember a group called the Damn Yankees? Ted Nugent, Uncle Ted was part of that. Tommy Shaw, Jack Blades, and I can't think of who else the other guy was. Um, but I was working with uh, Uncle Ted at the time, and we were in Florida. It wasn't my full-time job. I was still at that point considering leaving my full-time job with a TV studio and going to work with Ted. But we were down in Florida. We uh, did some gator hunting, and there was something else he did while we were down there. And then also they were doing a show. Damn, Way- Damn Yankees was doing a show in Fort Lauderdale, maybe it was. Somewhere. And, uh, of course, we shot some video of that. that. That was part of the whole thing. This is when Ted was doing his early TV show, and I was working with him on it. And at one point, I found myself in the backseat of a limousine with Ted Nugent, Tommy Shaw, Jack Blades, and uh, Michael Cardalone or something like that, Pat. So here, here I am riding from the hotel over to the venue where the concert was in the backseat of a limo with damn Yankees. Isn't it interesting (laughs) where a career will take you? From walleye fishing at night on Muskegon Lake and the Muskegon Channel with Mark Martin to the backseat of a limousine with the damn Yankees in Florida. And on lots of places in between. It is pretty cool, though. I mean, when you have a love and a passion and an interest in something, like I do for the outdoors, maybe like you do, but, but everybody has it. Well, I don't know. I think everybody has something that fires them up, that keeps them motivated, that keeps them interested, that gets them excited. I hope everybody does. You know, it may be the outdoors, it may be technology, it may be, I don't care, gardening, whatever it is. I think you've got to take advantage of, of that, Whatever that is. In my case, it's hunting and fishing and the outdoors and broadcasting and all that other good stuff. But I think if you can tap into what really gives you joy, what gets you excited, I I think, I don't know, I think it makes life go by in a lot better mood, a lot better frame of mind. At least you'll be in a better mood, a better frame of mind. And if you do love the outdoors... I mean, I'm telling you, I, I, I'm convinced. I've said this before. I don't think there's a better place than Michigan. Don't forget, as we were talking about earlier, May is the time to apply for your fall bear tag here in Michigan and your fall elk tag. You've got until the end of the month. Uh, walleye season opens in the UP this weekend. Um, you've still got some time, late season turkey hunters. That season will go through the end of May. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be out there tomorrow as we're recording the show. I'm going to be out there tomorrow morning and then we'll see what happens after that. Because if I do get my hands on that angler quest later in the week, that may become my focus for the next several weeks. Jason Walleye on Saginaw Bay. We'll uh, take a break here on the Outdoor Magazine show. In fact, our last break of the show. 
When we come back, wild game chef extraordinaire Dave Miner. Dave wraps up each week's show with a, a great wild game recipe. And since at this time of day, as we are recording the show, it's almost noon. Those recipes always sound good. In fact, I've never had a bad recipe. Never. Some of them may not have been my my preferred taste, but I've never had anything bad from wild game chef extraordinaire Dave Miner. And he'll be with us after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. Welcome back to Outdoor Magazine. Thanks for joining us this week. I do appreciate it. No Outdoor Magazine show would be complete. I'm going back to the days of Outdoor Magazine television through the days today of Outdoor Magazine radio. No Outdoor Magazine show would be complete without a visit from my good friend, wild game chef extraordinaire, Dave Miner. And he's with us once again. David, welcome back. How are you? I'm doing really good. And yourself, Mike? I'm doing just great. Couldn't be better. Couldn't be better. Good, good. Did you get your turkey yet? No, not yet. Um, still working on it. Um, we'll see. I mean, you know, I, I've had some close encounters. Uh, have not had a shot opportunity yet. But if if my season ended today, um, I would still think it would be a good season, even though I didn't take a bird. How about you? Same thing. The birds, uh, I've had nice time setting in the woods. Yeah, uh, enjoying the spring, springing all around me, but no turkey yet. They yeah. just kind of left their area. Normally, yeah. we got them crawling all over the place. But I now. heard that. I hear that from so many people this spring, Dave. That uh, that I actually posed the question to the DNR, and they admitted that the number of birds is down across Michigan and across the country. So it's not just our imagination. Huh. Okay. Well, I just thought it was. Uh, our piece of property. No, right I don't think so. I don't think so. But for those hunters lucky enough to get a bird, or if you and I end up getting a bird, how about a recipe? Well, I like uh, to make turkey breast with a sweet sauce. We did uh, strawberries before. We did uh, the morels. Now we're going to do with frangelico. It's kind of sweet. So you're going to need, uh, after you get the bird breasted out, if you're going to just do that, cut it across the grain, probably inch and a half thick or so. Check for any shot drift, any stray shot that might have made it into the breast meat. And then put it between plastic wrap and then pound it down quite thin. You'll be surprised that it will drop back, you know. So you might think, oh, it's a little too thin, but you want to do it that way to break up the fiber so it doesn't pucker when it cooks. So, like I said, about 8 to 10 ounces per person. You need a medium onion dice, nice and fine, and frangelico liquor. You don't want to buy a big bottle. A lot of party stores sell the one-ounce airline uh, bottles of uh, frangelico and brandy and other stuff like that. So you could do that if you didn't want to buy the whole one. A couple cloves of garlic, two, three ounces of heavy cream, a fresh 12-ounce package of fresh mushroom sliced real thin. You need a jar of chicken or beef gravy. And as I said, you're going to use a little bit of uh, brandy, olive oil, and some flour. I like to sprinkle a little bit of uh, white pepper on the uh, breast meat, then flour it, and then a real nice hot pan. You want to brown that meat on both sides. Take it out and put it in a casserole. So then you're going to take the uh, vegetables, the onion, the mushrooms, the garlic, and you're going to saute that kind of slowly. You don't want to burn it. You don't want to brown it. You just want to cook it up. Break the flavor loose. Add your jar of gravy to that. Um, bring that up to a boil. Add your booze to that, whether it's the frangelico and the brandy. Then it won't flame up. Cook it for just a, a little bit more. Then you're going to taste it and see if it's to your liking. If it is, put it in an oven. Put it in the uh, oven in that casserole that had the breast already in it. Kind of a single layer would be nice. And um, I would have to say you're going to go probably 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how big and old that Tom was, that you get it 350 degrees uncovered because you're going to want to let this reduce down. So then just before you're done, you can add the heavy cream, and that'll give it that nice light flavor or uh, eye appeal. And if you want, you can put a couple pats of butter in there and then kind of stir that around. Fresh butter will make that have a nice glisten to it and a nice sheen and uh, 
kind of velvetize it. It looks like that, man. And this would be great to serve with a wild rice blend or make sure if you're going to get fiddlehead ferns, you don't use the black bracken ones. They're not the best eye appeal. They have a little tuft of, uh, like, looks like cotton, mm-hmm. cotton ball in it, and it's really uh, bitter, and I guess it's not too good for you. Dave, you, other mean, one, you, you well, said something about white pepper. You know how much I love pepper. Why white pepper? What does that do? Um, well, it doesn't discolor the sauce. It doesn't add anything other than flavor. And white pepper is actually a much more pungent, peppery, spicy, hot than the, the black pepper flakes because they're shaving off that outside and using just the inside of the uh, peppercorn when they're grinding it up real fine like that. It's got great flavor. I knew you'd have a reason. I knew you'd have a reason. <laughs> All these trips and uh, tips and uh, tricks and advice that you've generated and come up with over the years. Pretty cool, Dave. Well, thanks a lot. You know what? I've been working on getting the restaurant uh, back up to running uh, stuff. Shooting. We're shooting for some time in June. No kidding. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's We're outstanding. I've been at it. Fast and furious as much as I can, uh, and still uh, try to do a little bit of hunting. But <laughs> got to get the restaurant open. It's time now that they're relaxing more of the uh, the restrictions upon us. I'm going to go for it. Excellent. I've been wanting to ask, but afraid to. You made my day. Well, we could do a Wednesday night after we get rolling for a little while. See how things go. Once we get rolling, we'll plan on it. Wild Game Chef extraordinaire Dave Miner with some great news there. Dave is a big part of the Outdoor Magazine show, as are you, because if you weren't listening, there'd be no reason for me to do the show. I would encourage you uh, during the week, check out the website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. Follow me on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Oh, what else is out there? Twitter. Eh, yeah, Twitter. Yeah, Twitter. Uh, my uh, email address is mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com. That's mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com. You can always reach me there. Send me a question, a comment, whatever, um, and I will be back in touch with you. And I will talk with you next time right here on Outdoor Magazine. Outdoor Magazine.